All right, so um, welcome. We are going to cover sprints 58 and 59 today. We have a lot to cover, actually. Um, so I'm just gonna cruise through these slides. Um, not a lot of team changes. Couple on core functional. Um, we did have a new developer from Texas A&M, Jason Savell, but he's actually already rotated off again and Jeremy uh, Huff has taken his place. So welcome back, Jeremy, and thanks, Jason, for your contributions. And um, Magda is, um, she's not new to Folio, but she is new on the core functional team. She's taken on the PO role. So um, she is POing title level requests and SIP2 for the core functional team. So we're excited to have Magda as a PO now. Other than that, I didn't see any um, new additions to Teams. So that brings us to the Q1 milestone slide here somewhere, which I will, here we go. Q1 uh, release uh, milestone. So this one is for Jakob. You on, Jakob? Uh, thank you, Kate. Sure. We've covered the uh, last couple of sprint reviews, so I'll just keep a short update, update about the progress. Uh, yesterday, we had a deadline for all the remaining modules uh, uh, that belong to the so-called platform complete. That's a collection of all folio modules. Um, and we will know shortly uh, whether all the modules um, have been released properly and if there are any uh, any integration issues or any uh, dependency issues. Though any of those issues will be reported to the release Q1 2019 channel, so uh, I would like to ask all the maintainers who are on this call to pay attention. I know you guys pay attention to, to that channel, but please, uh, please pay extra attention in the next couple of days because John and other guys from the, from the platform team um, who are setting up the environments for the for the release will be reporting any issues uh, like uh, missing dependencies or, or some problems with the, the release versions. Um, so uh, that will continue for the next um, uh, for this sprint, sprint sixty, uh, and we are planning to have uh, a uh, running Q Q one environments ready. Um, by the 8th of April, so by the end of the sprint. Uh, and there will be some, some bug fixes released in the meantime. There already has been some bug fixes released uh, for some of the core modules. There might be more uh, coming and they will be in, uh, integrated into the release. So that's the, that's the updates. Uh, and that's all I have for the, for the Q1 release. Okay. Um, did you have anything you wanted to say about the definition of done? No, I, I don't think this slide has changed since the last review. So there is, there is really nothing new um, uh, to mention uh, specifically about the definition of done. I would just okay. say that we are um, going ahead with, um, with the plan of increasing uh, frequency of module releases in, um, in Q2. Uh, we would like to see the modules released uh, monthly, but it requires some planning around existing dates and sprints and making sure it all fits. So there's, there's been a proposal out. Um, uh, I've created a chat for the cat and all the maintainers of the modules um, so that they can provide a feedback uh, on that proposal. Uh, we discussed this um, and briefly a couple of times already, uh, but uh, I'd like to make sure that uh, any reservations, any, any potential issues are reported back. So if you guys have any feedback, if you see any problems around the proposal, which is on the uh, tech grid specifically, report that back to me because we'll be discussing that further and making a final announcement soon. That's all I have. Thank you, Kate. All right. Thanks, Jakob. I'm just gonna mute everybody, um, but feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions. Um, all right, so um, next slides have all the details for the work that's been done by the teams. Um, really a ton of work, um, both you know, new feature functionality and lots of bug fixes. Um, so take a look if you're interested in the details and um, 
lots of this stuff will be demoed as well today. As you can see, we've got a long list of presenters. Um, Owen really wanted to demo for ERM. I guess they've made some really good progress. He really wanted to show what's been happening, but he wasn't able to make this meeting. And also we just had so many other people we wanted to have present. Um, he wasn't able to, to get it to happen. Um, but you can see we do have core platform presenting this time, a number of folks from the core platform team, which is kind of a special treat. So I'm excited to see um, what people have to show today. So um, let's get started, because uh, I think there's a lot here. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to the Thunderjet acquisitions team. It looks like Andre is first and then Peter, or feel free to switch it around if that makes sense. Hey, well, so uh, I will start. I'm uh, Peter from acquisitions team and uh, uh, I started sharing my screen, hope you can see it. And uh, I will just uh, going to start from minor updates to purchase order and purchase order line. Uh, basically, uh, one of the updates was uh, related to uh, removal of adjustment because with uh, uh, invoicing uh, application work is uh, being started already and uh, uh, the adjustment functionality moved to invoice. And that's why uh, it's removed from purchase order and purchase order line level. Also, additionally, uh, uh, some updates to uh, purchase order line cost introduced. And uh, for example, I already have uh, uh, some order. We, uh, and let's have a look at pure line. Uh, for example, this one is uh, electronic resource and uh, um, the cost of details now has uh, uh, additional fields like optional additional cost and uh, discount. And uh, one of uh, the improvements also just to separate uh, price for physical and uh, electronic resources. As this one is uh, electronic resource purchase order line, uh, we can see that uh, unit price of electronic is uh, uh, populated and quantity electronic populated. And also I uh, just already applied some discount, which is uh, flat in, in this case, just $2. Uh, and uh, estimated price, user can see uh, this tooltip icon and uh, uh, see the calculation of the uh, estimated price. It's just all uh, unit prices multiplied by quantity ordered and uh, uh, minus discount. And discount uh, doesn't include additional cost when, cal when it's calculated and uh, additional cost added to estimated price. So this is this uh, uh, estimated price is being calculated. And uh, for example, uh, another purchase order line is uh, physical resource. Here we can see vice versa that uh, unit price and quantity physical is populated. And for this one, it's specified discount as percentage amount and some additional cost. As well, estimated price is uh, calculated uh, following the rules. So just uh, uh, have a look at uh, creation of the uh, B mix uh, order line. I'm going to add new purchase order line. And uh, we can see that by default discount is uh, uh, already populated. So the reason is that uh, uh, this is the first of uh, uh, one of the first integration part with uh, vendors. And actually I specified for my order uh, EBSCO subscription services vendor. And this vendor provides uh, discounts of uh, 11%. For example, if uh, I go uh, and uh, add it vendor details and change discount, for example, to 5%. And after update, th uh, these updates will be uh, reflected also once we create new purchase order line. We, we go back to orders application and now we see that 5% uh, discount is already repopulated. So user can still edit uh, this information if needed. And for example, as I mentioned, uh, if we select order time type uh, uh, physical electronic mix, we will see that all the uh, input fields are available for population. And we can specify separate uh, quantities and uh, uh, prices for physical and for electronic resources. For example, for electronic, it will be higher and only one. And uh, a user can see already uh, populated estimated price. 
if user changes, uh, to example, to 6% discount, uh, estimated price also will be recalculated. We can add additional uh, cost if needed, and also it's uh, uh, been included into estimated price. So basically that's all about minor changes which introduced within uh, last two sprints, and the main piece uh, will be demonstrated by Andre. If you have questions about cost details or anything else, please let me know. If not, I will stop sharing. Okay, thank you very much. Hope it was useful. Thank you, Peter. That was really great. Uh, Andre? Yes, hello all. Do you see my screen? Yes. It's a great sign. Okay, we are on uh, Folio snapshot uh, and we can start uh, today i'm going to present full cy cycle of receiving flow previously our team uh, presented uh, a part of these changes uh, and uh, it was about integration with inventory uh, now we can uh, present all that we have uh, i prepared uh, order uh, we can see that uh, order includes uh, three lines uh, and uh, pay your attention on workflow status, uh, it's open, and the uh, total units, it's uh, nine. Uh, and just uh, remind you that uh, when a uh, user change workflow status from pending to open in inventory, are creating uh, pieces uh, that can uh, receive. And um, uh, to start uh, uh, receiving flow, uh, the world of status uh, of order should be open. We have uh, open status and we can uh, start to receive. When we click to receive button, uh, we were redirected uh, to receiving uh, list uh, page. Uh, we can see group of button, it's receiving item and receiving history. And uh, if we click uh, receiving history, there are no items uh, in there. And uh, now we see three lines, uh, status of receiving, it's um, uh, how many items uh, we want to receive and uh, the, st the full uh, count of items. We can uh, check one by one or we can uh, check all items and um, try to receive. We see model window with the first line. We can uh, check one or all, and um, we can't uh, input a barcode because uh, for electronic resources, um, barcode field is disabled. So we can proceed. It's a pair line number two, and we can uh, check some and uh, enter barcode for them, click next. Uh, we can see the third line uh, with the barcode. It uh, was uh, fetched from inventory, if any. And uh, we can uh, change uh, location if needed. So the last screen, it's uh, review details. Uh, user can uh, check uh, what he want to receive and uh, make some changes. And if needed, uh, he want, he can go to previous screen and uh, make changes if needed. Okay, uh, if we click receive, we are redirected to receiving history and here, can see items that uh, that were received by us. Yes, and uh, if we go back to receive an item, mm, we can see only two lines because one of them uh, includes only one item, and uh, the we can see changes. We can use uh, search if need. Okay, it works. And uh, if a user made a mistake, he can um, remove uh, item from this list. And uh, okay, let's remove this one. Uh, we can see confirmation model, and we can cancel, or we can confirm 
removing removing was successful and uh, we can see this item there so uh, we can go to inventory and find our pieces we can see in this one it's the status on order and we can see the second one it's all uh, all pieces all five pieces and uh, two of them with status in process and uh, three of them on order and uh, we can see that uh, two items were received and three are uh, uh, in the expected uh, status mm. is that it from my side if you have question let me know I have a question, Andre. Um, what, when you were receiving, there was an item status menu. What were your options there? Aside from in process, was there another option as well? Uh, not now. Okay. Now we have only one status uh, in process. Uh -huh. But in the future, maybe there will be some more. Okay. So I think, uh, I think some of that is still under discussion, um, Kate. Okay. I think the default is to um, is to go with in process, but I, I believe that there was also a requirement that we should be able to change it to something else. Um, and so there's still a lot of discussions about that and whether or not uh, the item status should be um, allowed to be set by the user or if that's something that should be set by the machine and by you know the system itself. Interesting. Okay. All right. I guess we'll wait and see. Thank you. All right, awesome. So um, thank you, Thunderjet. Um, Follyjet is up next. It looks like Victor is first. Uh, yep, uh, hello. Uh, could you please uh, confirm that you share my screen? Yes, you can see it. Thank you, great. So uh, today we are going uh, to demo the latest pieces of uh, Fire Extensions uh, feature. And uh, I want to begin with editing uh, functionality. For example, uh, we have existing file extension CSV and we want to edit it. And uh, once I hit edit button, I want to show validation stuff, uh, which is also in place uh, when we want to uh, change uh, file extension to some existing one. So we uh, already have this PDF extension uh, in that list. And once we want to save this one, we uh, get an error that these extensions already exist. So let me create another one. And let's proceed with saving. And uh, in that, that time we see uh, instantly the newly created file extension. And now uh, the source, uh, uh, for updated field uh, has changed and now we see it uh, administrator deco and before we had system which is uh, we have here for uh, record created entry and uh, also I want to proceed uh, with uh, adding new one just for the sake of the next uh, for the next uh, feature which I want to present. Let's create the GS extension. So now we see uh, that uh, it's already in place. And we also had some uh, edited items. So, uh, and the next feature which I want to present is a set existing uh, file ex extensions to system defaults. So uh, once I uh, hit the uh, reset uh, confirmation button, we'll uh, end up with a default uh, predefined list. So, which is uh, what we have now. And uh, the last feature uh, which I want to present is the search functionality. We uh, had it uh, before, but uh, not at all extent. And uh, our search implementation support uh, searching by extension and data types fields. So let me show it for extension one. Uh, 
And we also added the highlighting feature, uh, uh, which uh, was uh, specified in the mockups. And let me show that we also can validate uh, for Mark. And uh, I want to point out also that uh, our search is case insensitive. So in that case, we see that both extension for Mark and data types, uh, which we see here, are also highlighted. And this is all for my part. Uh, if you have any question, please raise with me, or I'm also going to stop sharing my screen, and uh, Sasha will proceed with his part. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Victor. Um, okay, so I think there is no questions. Uh, thank you, Victor. Hello, colleagues. Uh, let me start with sharing my screen. Um, I hope you can see it. Yes, we can. Um, so I'm going to continue this presentation and demonstrate uh, uh, validation for uh, file uploads. Uh, so we are now on the settings page and uh, Please pay attention that uh, we have this uh, GIF file extension uh, with, which has a uh, block uh, import. And now uh, let me navigate to the landing page and uh, try to uh, upload a few files with uh, GIF extension. Uh, by doing so, uh, the modal window uh, appears and uh, it says that uh, we are not able to upload uh, uh, blocked uh, import file extensions. Uh, so uh, if I'm, uh, let me come back to settings and uh, delete that file extension. Um, so uh, after doing so, uh, let me try to upload uh, G files again and uh, now we can, uh, uh, the uh, model window does not appear and uh, we can proceed with uploading. Uh, so um, another kind of validation is uh, validations of uh, file extensions uh, consistency. Uh, so uh, when we upload uh, files with different extensions, uh, the, uh, another kind of model window will appear and uh, uh, it uh, says that uh, you cannot upload files with different extensions. Uh, so, uh, and uh, the last one uh, validation is uh, the validation of, um, oh, so uh, when we don't have NAS memory on the server, uh, another kind of model uh, is going to appear, uh, but for some technical reasons, I'm not able to demonstrate it uh, uh, I just, I cannot simulate uh, such behavior, but uh, this validation is present. Uh, so um, I believe that's it from me. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And uh, after me, uh, my colleague Alexei will proceed to his uh, presentation. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you. Looks good, thank you. Okay, uh, hello all, do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Nice, <clears throat> so I share with community some boring backend stuff, uh, but uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, the first part of our data import uh, process is uh, ready. So now we can upload a uh, mark uh, file to the server and uh, parse it and save in our source record storage. So we need to upload file using our application. This file contains a couple of mark records. Okay, the file is successfully uploaded to the server and now uh, we need to simulate uh, behavior when we uh, choose a job profile and start our um, 
upload process uh, for these files. So we need to get some stuff. Okay. Uh, during this uh, request, we uh, simulate this uh, functionality that we want to start processing uh, these uploaded files with uh, current uh, selected job profile uh, for mark uh, records. And sending this request, we start starting our process. And now we try to found the so part. Uh, Alexey, uh, could you, are you sharing uh, your post? Yeah, uh, uh, client, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. West Client, but we see only uh, application page right now. Okay. Now I try to change. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Victor. Yes, yeah, see. Uh, see. Okay, nice. Uh, so uh, we send a request through Postman to um, <clears throat> start this process, and now we uh, call our mod source record storage to uh, found past records from these files. And here we okay, we found the source records that was uh, parsed uh, from this uploaded file. Uh, each record contains a raw record information that was in file and a parsed record that was parsed from this original data. And also contains same, some kind of metadata for it. <clears throat> and I think uh, that's it for uh, up upload functionality and for stage of data import uh, and in Q2 release we want to integrate our mod source record storage with um, inventory and uh, proceed our work with uh, job profiles and um, uh, matching profiles and so and uh, another one that I want to share with community is uh, about uh, our uh, teamwork for uh, increasing our test coverage. So all our models in um, Sonar Cloud uh, have zero bugs, duplication, and smells, and uh, coverage for all of these models is more than 80%. So <clears throat> that's all from my side. Thank you. If you have questions, I'm ready to answer for it. Looks great. Thanks, Alexi. That's a, a major milestone, getting those mark records parsed into source record storage. Thank you. All right. So uh, let's see, Vega is up next. And I have uh, Alexander as the first presenter. OK. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see? Yes. Okay. Uh, today I want to show you an OTS policy form. It was reworked by Vega team. And I want to start from creating pattern notice template. Okay. I just fill in some testing data and proceed with saving. Okay. Uh, I have chosen loan category because I want to show you the flow of adding uh, loan notices. So let's go to the notice policy form and add new notice policy, notice policy. Um, first of all, notice card was reworked and uh, we can choose a recently created uh, pattern notice template. Currently we can choose only email format and uh, let's proceed with the triggering event. There are two types of it, time-based and user-initialized events. For loan notices, there is only one time-based event, uh, loan due date. If you choose time-based event, additional fields for frequency and how to send it will be shown. 
in case when we want to send notice, notice before or after event, we can choose the time when to send it. For example, two hours. Okay, uh, we have the same behavior for the frequency. frequency. If we choose a recurrent, we will get the possibility uh, to choose uh, a send every period. For example, we can send every two days. Okay, flow is almost the same for request notices. notices. Um, but they have its own uh, templates and there are different triggering events. Uh, same, there is only one time-based event, hold expiration. And uh, let's proceed with saving. So, uh, as you can see, uh, notice, notice policy was added successfully. Also, I want to mention that uh, Vega team was working on uh, tests for UI circulation module, and we have reached 60% coverage. Of course, it's not required 80, but we've only just begun. If you have any questions, please let me know, or I will stop sharing my screen and Dima proceed with his part. Okay. Thank you. Mm, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Today I am going to present the functionality of sending pattern notices for uh, check-in and uh, check-out actions. Uh, let me first share my screen. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, pattern notices settings. Um, the first step is uh, pattern notice templates. Uh, templates specify uh, how mes message should look like uh, when pattern receive it. It contains uh, different placeholders which will be replaced by a specific con context um, when it's sent. Uh, I have prepared uh, check-in and check-out received uh, templates. Uh, the next step is uh, notice policy. Uh, Sasha has described it in a previous part. Uh, I'd like only to say that uh, here I have uh, prepared uh, notice policy for demo uh, with checkout and check-in receipt uh, set as uh, templates for checkout and check-in uh, events. And the last step is uh, circulation rules. Uh, this engine calculates, then uh, also calculates the dice policy um, based on different information like um, item, material type, or uh, pattern uh, group. Uh, here I have uh, a notice policy for demo set up uh, for material book, material type book, and group faculty. So let's move to the demo itself. I'll uh, try to check out an item to prepare it user. Um, with email stop. Um, and here we have uh, the checkout. Let me refresh it. Uh, and here is uh, email. Um, the template uh, was processed and uh, uh, placeholders were replaced with something like pattern uh, first name or item title and due date. And almost the same is for uh, check-in. Uh, here we have a check-in receipt uh, with a message. Um, okay, I think that's all from my side. Uh, please ask questions if you have. Dimitra, that's so cool. <laughs> I don't have a question. I just want to say congratulations. It's really cool to see that working. And congratulations to Darcy too, who I know has been working forever on designing and specking this all out. So it's really cool. Um, it looks like Costa wanted to also present something. Yep, sure. Good day to all. Um, let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. 
Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So today I'm going to present you a request expiration feature. Uh, there are two cases uh, when a request becomes expired. Uh, the first one, a, a request should, ha uh, should have a status open not yet filled and uh, request expiration date in the past. And uh, the second case, a, a request should have a status open awaiting pickup and uh, hold shelf expiration date in the past. Uh, what expiration means here? Actually, two, um, two things. The first one is um, request, er, expired request means closed request. And in case if a request queue contains more than one request, uh, position uh, reordering happens. Sadly, it's hard to show your request expiration in action. Uh, because of uh, update interval, currently it's one hour, and uh, I've prepared two request queues to show you the results. Uh, the first one is about open not yet field request. As, as you can see, uh, this request uh, queue consists of two requests and one, the first one <clears throat> uh, became expired some time, some time ago and uh, the second one uh, currently have a position number one in this queue. And uh, the second case uh, is a with uh, await and pick up request expiration. Uh, here you can see uh, also two requests. Uh, the first one uh, became expired some time, some time ago and uh, the second one uh, now has a position one. Uh, actually, that is it. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks, Kostya. This looks Thank really you. good. I've been testing this myself and I know, I know it works. Great. All right. Thank you, Vega. Um, I think that was it. Yep. So Spitfire is up next with Igor first. Hello. Um, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? I do. Oh, great. So today we want to share with you our updates in the eHoldings application. I will start with uh, the text functionality, which is added to providers, packages, titles, and resources. Uh, so <clears throat> we can open any record. Uh, you can see the text. Uh, drop down here. Uh, this drop down is populated from the uh, folio uh, mod text. Uh, so uh, we can add the new text uh, uh, from the existing or create uh, the new one. Uh, Texts are sorted uh, alphabetically. Uh, so also we have same text on uh, the packages. Yeah. Uh, so the newly created tag appeared already here. Um, so also we have uh, we have it on the packages records. Uh, we can uh, move or add new tags uh, and we have it on title records. And uh, also uh, we have it uh, for sources. Uh, that's basically it for text. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, 
to ask. If not, uh, Yuri will proceed uh, with the agreements uh, integration updates. Thanks, Igor. That looks great. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Hello. Let me share the screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, uh, so um, our team uh, uh, have the uh, possibility to attach uh, the agreements to e holdings packages uh, and uh, uh, resources through integration uh, with the agreements application. Uh, so here you can see a package details page. Uh, uh, so we have added an agreements accordion. Here you can see it as empty. But uh, we can attach uh, the agreements uh, which uh, I have created, uh, like I have created uh, uh, a test and set in the RAM application. Here you can see three agreements. We can go back uh, to e holdings and we can try to attach one of the agreements to e holdings package. So you can you can see it. We can add another one. Also, uh, by clicking on the agreement, uh, we can uh, go to the agreements details page in the RM application. So as for now, uh, it contains only the status and the start date. So let's do the same procedure for the resource. Let's go to titles. One moment, please. Oh, sorry, let's uh, let's try another name. Oops, let's refresh the page. Okay, here it is. Uh, so let's uh, select the resource. Here you can see already attached agreements and we can attach another one. So yeah, here you can see it. And also we can go to the agreements application after the click. So basically that's it. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. Thank you. Thank you. Really cool to see that integration. Um, okay, uh, Stripes Force is next with John Coburn. Uh, hi, Kate. <clears throat> Let's see, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, so uh, today I'm gonna be demoing a new system, a new a, a capability um, in the system for UI modules. Uh, can everybody see my screen okay? Uh, got a browser yes. window open, looking at inventory. Yep. All right, so uh, the particular feature uh, that I'm gonna show off, I'm actually showing this locally, uh, but it is uh, currently available uh, through the Stripes core that's live. Uh, I've only done an integration for it locally. Soon it'll be merged into users, hopefully, so everybody can kind of see the code there uh, once that's up. But 
uh, the capability here. Uh, so uh, most of the modules uh, up to this point, uh, they've had just a, a home link uh, over here available uh, in the upper left-hand corner with the module's name. So you'll see I'm, I'm in inventory right now on one of the edit pages and you can click on that on this home link and it'll go to the home of the module. Uh, so a new capability that we've added uh, through Stripe's core is the ability for UI modules to uh, create, uh, populate a application little context menu uh, specific to their application uh, on that home link. So I'll go over to my user's application here and you'll see um, once they do create one of these menus, uh, it has the little drop down carrot now uh, next to that link and uh, I open the drop down and uh, you can include uh, numerous useful items here uh, for your module. Uh, so for instance, I've got uh, a home page link uh, for this so I can go back to home through that. Uh, uh, and then uh, an easy link uh, to go over to the settings, which is a pretty good one, instead of having to dig through the apps menu and go to settings and do all that that way. Uh, you could include a link to this in this context menu and, and it'll go straight there. Uh, so that was quick and easy. And then uh, even external stuff. So like for instance, uh, a help page or something in, in the Folio Wiki here, I'm, I'm actually linking out just for example to the, the usage tips page for users. Uh, not a lot of content there. Uh, shout out to Anne-Marie though for setting up these pages. But um, uh, so this is uh, so very quick, uh, just quick code to do this. There's a quick read me up. It's a very, it's a single component that they just bring in uh, and build out a nav list with it uh, within their application. Uh, and it'll expose it in this upper left hand corner of the UI. Cool. Thanks, John. Mm hmm. I had seen like a, I think an enhancement or a bug or something somewhere in the backlog that said you should be able to click the app, like click the icon itself for the app and have it take you to the home screen. Yeah. Do you know if that's still the plan or is it like you actually will open the menu and select home? So uh, for the instance I showed like with, with inventory and all the apps, uh, the, the button over here, uh, where this drop down is now, it is the home link, uh, ah. so as a whole. So, so, and uh, across all the apps now, that's, that's the behavior. Okay. Uh, so click it in inventory or, or anywhere else. And if you're on a different screen, it'll take you back home. Um, so, and of course, in the case where you're turning that into a drop down, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta stick the, keep that functionality there. So that's why this homepage link is, is, is a suggested, uh, well, it's a must have really in this menu to sort of retain that functionality I see. along with these other guys. So. All right. Mm -hmm. Great. Good deal. Um, and that's, that's it for me. All right. Thank you, John. Okay, um, next up is Core Functional. Uh, Ditya is first. Thanks, Gip. Um, sharing my screen. Um, can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so I have quite a few stories to demo here today, specifically in the requests, check in and check out applications. Um, so starting off with the request app. Um, there's been a few new features and also a bit of remodeling in the request app. Um, you can see a new filter here, open in transit to enable the request list to be filtered by the open in transit status. Um, if we select it, um, you can see a list of requests uh, filtered by the request status of open in transit. And also this uh, request status uh, has been capitalized and also sorted alphabetically. Um, so now let's go into one of the view request pages, paints, and we have this request on item position in queue. So we have these links to the request queue on the view and edit pages um, right here and also here. These are there across folio. So all of these basically link to the request queue uh, filtered by the barcode and the open statuses. Um, so let me show you 
to the edit page. Right. Um, so these been these have been also added to the inventory as well as the users application. So if I go to inventory. Um, So the link here, this would take you back to the same request queue filtered by the barcode and the open status. And this is also present on the user's application. Just a second, I had, the, yeah. So Zach has added this part, the linking. Um, so if you click on the open request under the request accordion, it would take you to the same request queue. So let's now move to the request create page. So we have added something called whitelist. Mihail basically worked on this part. Whitelist basically defines uh, which request types are allowed for different item status values. For example, um, for item status of checked out, awaiting pickup or in transit, you can only have a hold or a recall request type. So as you can see, um, 14 calls for America's current item status is in transit. And this is a bit of remodeling that's been done to this page uh, where we render only the hold or recall options based on the item status. So if we actually uh, select an item that's available, uh, Yeah. We copy the barcode requests. So for item status available, you have this request type of page. So yeah, so there's only, so this is done to help the user to select the correct type of request for the selected item based on the whitelist. Um, so this request type of page is a new feature as well. That's been added to create a page request. So let's create one. Any user and also one thing uh, so if you try to create this request we get this error message saying we have to select an item this wasn't there previously and was causing a lot of um, test failures as well as other bugs so that's been fixed so let's select the service point to be different from the one here on the admin create this request as you can see the request type is page um, another feature is um, where we check in an item um, that has a request on it at a service point different from its home. So we have this selected. So you get this in transit model pop-up which says this book is in transit to serve this one. You can print the slip, if you uncheck it and you can close it. So if we had selected the same service point for the home and the admin, we would get the awaiting pickup pop-up. Um, right, and the next thing here is we have added the ability to display, assign, unassign, and output tags associated with individual requests. So you can see this tags here that is also a part of the users module. You can add a tag assign a tag, uh, you can see the count being incremented, decremented, and other basic tag functionalities. Um, and also these tags and copy numbers has been added to the CSV export on a request. Um, so if we, so basically just select all of them and Export this. So you can see there's been there's, there are tags on few of the requests and they are exported as a part of the CSV. And finally, in the request app, not in the request app, this is in the circulations request policy. 
we have the ability to delete these. Uh, previously, this wasn't there. So if I just create a test policy, from the drop down here, we can delete this or through the edit menu also you can delete the request policy. That's it for the request app. Uh, now let's move on to the missing item. So we have uh, added this ability to mark an item as missing whose current status is either available in transit or awaiting pickup as missing. Um, so let's find an item that's available first. All of them are available, okay. So from the drop down menu here, you can, you have this new icon mark as missing, which you can select. It says confirm item as missing and says this book will be marked as missing. If you confirm it, you can see the item status here changes to missing. And further features uh, include like what would happen if this item is checked in or checked out. I copy this barcode and I try to check this in. Should get this model saying, should I check in the missing item? And if we confirm it, the normal check-in process would take place. If you cancel it, that means the item is still missing. So let me confirm. And yeah, there are a lot of models on the check-in app. So the, but the first thing that shows up if the item is missing is the missing model. So this has also been added to the checkout application. So let us find an item that's available again. Mm -hmm. can try ABA journal. There's always lots on there, it seems. Okay, nice. All right, so inside the checkout app. Oh, sorry, I should have marked it as missing. Right, so it says, has the item status missing and cannot be checked out. So this part was done by Zach. And finally, I have, we have something called check-in notes. So let me again, just go back to the, uh, any item. Check-in notes, yeah. So you can add a check-in or a check-out note. So I'll add some random notes. Update this item. Copy the barcode and check this in. You get this model pop-up saying, Maybe a journal has three notes and will be checked in. So this is for the staff member to follow any special instructions uh, noted there. And if you confirm this again, the standard check-in process would take place. Close it and the book's been checked in. Um, so that's all I had for demo, any questions? Cool, thank you Aditya. I just wanted to say thank you for agreeing to demo so much um, this time. Actually, I know you did a lot of that work yourself, but you also demoed a lot of things for others as well. So thank you. Um, great, okay, so I don't know if Sean Thomas is on. He was gonna try to make it. I oh, am. Sean? Cool. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, let me see if I can share my screen here.
Can you see it? Yes, I can. Okay, very good. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, changes that have been made to what was formerly known as the loan rules editor, now is being called the circulation rules editor. And you can find that under settings, circulation, and then um, circulation rules. So what I've done here to demonstrate uh, what we've added is I've put in some, uh, some loan policies and we have some notice policies and request policies. So what's happened with um, circulation rules over the past quarter is that we've expanded the original functionality to be able to include um, uh, notice policies and request policies into the rules that you're that you're putting in here. So in order to do that, um, so the let me back up. So the basic point of that is because the the editor sort of works as um, a central switchboard for things that are coming in in terms of new loans or uh, a recall on an existing loan, things like that. And the system needs to know what basic policies um, it needs to go find in order to be able to do that. And it looks through the rules that are written into this uh, file in order to do that. So we've expanded this to be able to include the new types. Um, and one of the things that we had to do in order to do that was to basically add a syntax um, so that you can distinguish between the different um, the different policy types. And we also had to expand the fallback policy from including just loans to including uh, re requests and notices as well. So all of the original functionality that was in the editor in terms of being able to do um, sort of these nested rules uh, still applies. Um, but we've made a few interesting changes in order to be able to accommodate um, what is now sort of a, a hierarchical structure. So I'll put in um, I'll put in a new rule here just to show you how it works. So we're going to say um, in book. So material type is book. And we're going to do a loan type of course reserves. And we're going to nest this and say this is appropriate for patron group. Whoops. Whoops, sorry. Undergrad and graduate. And so now you can see we have a hierarchical display here. So we're going to choose the type of policy that we're going to um, apply this to. So a loan policy. And we're going to say this is a four hour reserve. And then we'll choose our request policy for reserves. We'll say this is hold only. And notice policy, we'll just pick one. And if we save these rules back, we've now added a new rule that says for material type book and uh, a loan type of course reserves for these patron groups, it'll have a four hour. Uh, reserve loan policy and it'll have the hold only request policy and a basic notice policy. So if we now go to uh, attempt to check out. Let's take an item and just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to put it on reserve. So we'll do a temporary loan type of course reserves and update the item. So I'll take this barcode, change my patron to one of the two that I just put in, either undergraduate or graduate, enter the barcode, and it pulled that uh, reserves four hour policy out. And so if we look at the loan details here, we can see that it's chosen uh, the appropriate uh, due time for it because it was a short-term loan. And at this point, if you were to, um, to make a request on this, it should apply to only the hold request type. If you attempted a recall, it should fail. Oops. 
Hmm. I know this was working. It was working. Okay. So we'll take a look at that, but um, that is the gist of the functionality is that it, it performs that, that central uh, coordination role across loans and requests and notices. So we'll ensure that that's working, but that's the basic gist. Questions? I guess not. Thanks, Sean. Okay. It's really helpful. Thank you. Oh, no. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, so I think the slide. Uh, yes, with that, we're done with core functional and on to core platform. And it looks like Kurt is first. Are you on, Kurt? Yes, I'm just trying to figure out the Zoom buttons here. One second here. All right, let me get my screen shared. So I'm to share the screen here and the appropriate desktop there, share the screen. And let's see, I should see a terminal. Is that showing up okay? Yes. All right, so what this is, is this is the, um, it's just a small developer utility to parse out the, um, the CQL to SQL conversions that show up in our log files. Um, so just to just give a, a quick look at what one of the logs uh, looks like. Um, I have a snapshot of one of our recent logs here. Um, so it's kind of long. Um, but uh, actually, if I could just take another look at it a little more. Um, um, we can see here what um, an example of what one of the log line looks like. Where we'll see it will show the CQL to SQL, um, and then the resulting conversion. So um, anyway, the um, the usage of the the uh, the tool is fairly simple. Um, we just uh, call it in the command line, just a Python script. And uh, we, we pass it the log file, and then we tell it where we want to put the output at. So I uh, will just put it as this temporary file here, and then just take a quick look at what it produces. So it gives us this uh, CSV output. So basically, what it is is uh, the, the the lines here. Or you have the or the, the fields here. You have the time that it took. Then you have the uh, CQL query, and then you have the resulting uh, SQL query. So we can quickly look through the log files and see uh, what query translations are being done and how long they're taking to help us to um, identify the slow queries and also to use it to generate our resulting um, tests that we do uh, for the uh, um, CQL to PGJSON uh, utility. Uh, we can also tell it to uh, remove any duplicate uh, queries um, so that we're only uh, to reduce the, the size of the log file so to just to uh, improve efficiency there. But that's really all it is. Um, so it's in the Folio tools uh, directory that we'll be using in the future to hopefully help refine the uh, CQL to PGJSON code. All right, cool. Thanks, Kurt. Let's see, do I need to release the screen? Is that how it works? Yeah. Right, Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Hongwei is up next. Hongwei? Yes. Uh, can oh. you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Do you say uh, some diagram called test case? Yes. Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, as um, part of the uh, folks of the core platform team, uh, we were trying to improve the performance. So for the past uh, few iterations, we focus on the check-in and the check-out because those are the main workflow used by a uh, library system. So uh, what you are seeing is on the screen is the over the you know uh, last few iterations, uh, you can see the response time for the check-in by barcode and check-out by barcode 
they improved a lot. So at the beginning, it was standing at you know over 25 seconds. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, the test based on 50 requests sent over 50 seconds. So basically one request per second. So at the beginning, it was over 25 seconds. Uh, after we improved that, you can see the line is drawn down really low, looks like a zero. Uh, actually, it's not zero. Mm, so if you look at the second screen, you can see it's currently is under, for the check-in is under 200 milliseconds. For the checkout by barcode is under 300 milliseconds. So uh, basically that's the results. Um, also, uh, since Nasib is is not here, so I will show uh, a tool he created in doing uh, this kind of work. So he was uh, profiling uh, check-in, check-out uh, performance, and uh, he analyzed the or copy log, and he created a tool called a Giraffe, and currently hosted under the Folio Labs. So basically, this tool is reading the copy log, then draw a, a graph based on all the API calls, you know, uh, copy calls, circulation, circulation calls, uh, circulation storage, calls inventory storage. So there's a diagram. So what this looks like is, uh, you know, real case gonna be something like this. Uh, if you say, I open this PDF, so you can see for the check-in, or oh, by barcode on the left side, the green box, that's the request. This translates to over 30 plus, you know, API calls to other modules, and some other modules make another call to other, you know, modules down the line. You can see you have a layer, layer, and a layer. So those green box basically are the request. Blue box are response, and the red box are those response with a pretty high response time. So it's a great tool for us quickly identifying you know, which API call uh, took a longer time. So uh, I think that's it. And oh, by the way, he prepared us uh, some slides, and I will paste a link to the uh, the chat channel so you guys can take a look. That's it for me. Awesome, Hongwei. Thank you. That's that graph is really crazy and really impressive performance improvements. Thank you. Okay. Um, cool. So looks like Eric is next. Hello, everybody. Yeah, let me just share here. Uh, all right. So uh, I'm here to present and make everyone aware of a new uh, optimization that can be used in virtually every backend module that will be contacting the database to retrieve items. Um, it's a new function uh, that is available in the PG utils. Uh, class as part of the RAML module builder. And um, it's meant to improve performance of retrieving very large data sets. Um, it's tunable, but generally our use case has been over 10,000 items. And uh, it's meant to, you know, basically stop full table scans from occurring um, across very large tables. Uh, the example that we were using was say a, a table set of a hundred thousand items and we only we were making a, a, a query on that table. The query would detect that and stop it at 10,000 so that it would save 90% of the time that it would have taken. And um, again, that's available in the Rainbow Monitor Builder uh, project. It's called uh, Get With Optimized SQL. And I hope that people will use it when it shows up in the next version of RMB. Um, we will most likely also be making tickets to roll them out into select cases in the future. That's all for me. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, Wayne is next. Okay, uh, let me share my screen here. Um, so what I what um, what I was working on in this uh, time was to um, uh, to integrate um, edge modules into our reference build so that they can be uh, tested and validated. Um, there are a number of uh, what edge modules are are um, modules that essentially 
offer um, a standard um, API to the outside world, and then, um, uh, like for example, uh, RTAC or OAI PMH, <clears throat> or um, uh, you know SRU would be another possibility, um, and uh, uh, and translate the calls uh, in that standard API to uh, calls to the uh, to the uh, Folio backend and uh, retrieve results in the sort of native standard formats that um, that the APIs uh, that are dictated by the APIs. So um, what I did was I created a couple of roles in um, in our Ansible build <coughs> platform for building uh, reference environments. Um, one is to uh, proxy edge modules. Um, it's called Stripes Engine X. Um, so if you're using Folio Ansible, you can use this role. It'll what it does is essentially set up a uh, <clears throat> an engine X server on the um, machine that you are uh, building and uh, sets it up to listen on port 8000 or you know you can change the port of course um, and um, and uh, you know basically gets it ready to proxy an edge module and then I wrote another role which is just an edge module role that basically sets up uh, an edge module um, using that proxy server. Um, so it deploys it as a Docker container and then it sets up Nginx to proxy it. Um, and uh, um, the result of this then is that on our reference environments, we have, um, <clears throat> we have right now uh, our tech set up uh, on the reference environment. It's unfortunately um, broken, but not because of how it's set up. I think there's something else going on. But you can see that if I make a query here to port 8000 um, with the path for the RTAC API, and I give it the proper um, the proper um, query parameters. So this is RTAC is a, a way of getting um, holdings information about instances. Um, so this is an instance uh, instance UUID. And then this is an issued API key. <clears throat> so if I uh, if I send that request, I do get a response back. Unfortunately, right now it doesn't give me the full response, but um, but the the service is up and running. So that's what I had. So if there are any questions, please feel free. Thanks, Wayne. Looks good. So there are two more core platform presenters, Ian and Adam, um, but I need to switch over to um, the QA update in like two minutes. So um, Ian, do you think you can do yours real quick or Adam, either one? Uh, sure, if you want to see it, I could try to do it in 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, that's definitely <laughs> quick. Love to see it, thank you. Um, so this one, this was about securing the Okapi supertenant. Um, so there's a user on it now that you need to authenticate if you want to make calls uh, to the supertenant. Uh, so this is on our reference environments now. Um, so there's basically a role in Ansible called Okapi Secure. If you're using the Folio Ansible um, library, you can use this role to have uh, have Okapi secured during the build. And I'll just demo it real quick. The, the implication that you might see is if you're talking to, I've got Folio snapshot here. Um, you're making, used to making requests without any other ad additional headers, you'll get, uh, it'll ask you for a, a copy tenant here. So we have to specify the super tenant uh, and then it, it should work then. And you'll see these modules are now enabled on the Okapi super tenant. Um, and if you wanted to do something like delete a tenant that requires position uh, permissions, you'd have to log in. Uh, so I'm just gonna log in using the auth and login interface here. And I can do that, uh, it gives me back a token which has to be included in any requests that require uh, authorization. And that's it. Great. Thanks, Ian. That was awesome. Any questions? All right. And with that, I think we do have to cut over to um, the QA update, because I know Anton needed a chunk of time, and we've only got 10 minutes left. Are you on, Anton? Yes, I'm here. One second, let me let me share the screen. Okay, so let me put it into presenter mode. Can you see my screen okay? 
Yep. Excellent. Okay, let me start talking real fast because I'm the only one standing between the lunch or dinner. Uh, okay, so uh, quickly on the Bugfest report, we uh, executed better test cycle than the first one. We executed everything that we planned. I included links to the tracking uh, spreadsheet uh, for the test cases. If anyone interested, we have more efficient bug uh, filing because we have fewer bugs rejected. We got 14% bugs dismissed versus 45% bug dismissed um, compared to the first bug fest. Total was 76 defects and they were all triaged and, law, um, and assigned to the teams. You can uh, see them in the Bugfest JIRA dashboard, link is here or you can find it on, um, in JIRA. And Bugfest report uh, wiki page is assigned, uh, is uh, included as well if you like to see it in the greater details. Um, now, um, okay, uh, next page. So this is the breakdown of the defects um, by components. Uh, and, uh, so what happens the most of the bugs were logged against the core modules and therefore we have a lot of defects logged against core functional teams so they get the most, um, most of the defects they had to, do, uh, they had to deal with. Uh, so that being said, we kind of uh, segue to the um, to the bug triage process because that's what we'll be focusing on uh, in this sprint and in the following quarter. So we kind of need to get in a common uh, set the common denominator how we're going to triage bugs. So you can see this is the total bug open bug count that we have. And uh, obviously, they need to be they need to be triaged. And uh, again, the most of them assigned to core functional team, and the other teams will have easier job to deal with it. So I think the most so I think core functional team will should source some help from some uh, fr from some other teams. Um, so how are we going to do the bug triage process? So uh, we suggest that between uh, uh, this week, the beginning of this week and April 5th, just uh, have several meetings, um, maybe a couple a week, and triage, try to triage everything that you have, uh, figure out how many P1s that you have. I don't think we have that many. Uh, we have seven, so, and I think four of them are for UNAM, but I don't think it's uh, categorized properly. So triage P1s and P2 and prioritize them, see if you can resolve them so when we get a Q1 release out, we don't have any P1 or P2 defect, uh, defects outstanding. Uh, any uh, severe performance issues would be great to fix as well, so prioritize them to the top if you know about them. I know we have a lot of uh, performance issues that we're not aware of, but the ones we do try to prioritize them to the top. Um, now, uh, how to uh, 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 how to uh, how to sort priority? Um, so decide uh, decide what what's going to be fixed. Fix it now. Uh, does it have to be fixed now? Is it possible to fix later? It will be based on priority of defect. Anything that you're not going to fix, close it with one fix so it, does, so it would affect uh, how many open bugs we have. So right now we have a lot of them that are old and probably not even applicable anymore. So you should go through them and just close them out because they no longer valid. Uh, that would improve our focus uh, and improve our stats. Um, Setting defect priority is very subject, uh, subjective uh, subject, but uh, I'll speak further uh, how to systemically approach that. Usually you, um, you prior, uh, prioritize based on uh, how severe issue for the, uh, uh, is the issue for the business. 
uh, is it um, how easy it is to discover? Do you really need to dig deep or it's uh, easy to find? Do I have resources available to fix it? Do I have time to fix it? So it's all kind of comes in a place when you set the priority for the, for the defect. Um, so, uh, so you should, while you triage, you should review defect, assess defect, and, as, and as, uh, estimate it and assign it. Uh, well, the first question, is it a valid bug? Maybe it's uh, not reproducible, so not reproducible, close it. Uh, how severe it is? Does it crash the app completely or it just, you cannot complete a little task or there are other workarounds available to complete the task, so that defines severity. And then you decide uh, when to fix it. So you, it uh, takes a place in your uh, backlog board. So, and that's the table that we came up with um, uh, for uh, uh, priority levels. So P1 is urgent. It means like most like a May Day situation where it has to be fixed right away because if you run into it, it crashes or your data is being corrupt or your security getting exposed. So basically severe uh, impact on the system, system unusable, customer cannot function. P2 is uh, uh, have to be fixed as soon as possible. Uh, so the uh, user cannot perform a business function and um, uh, maybe there is a temporary acceptable workaround or customer can wait and not perform that function full until they get the fix, but, um, or customer is forced to spend extra resources to deal with an issue. So that's, P, uh, that's P2. P3 is um, product uh, doesn't meet certain criteria. So it's, uh, it should have worked, but it little something um, doesn't work exactly as it, uh, as it was intended. It's a uh, problem is isolated and it's minor imp impact on the, on the customer. So it can be, uh, it doesn't need to be fixed in this release. It can actually scheduled and wait to be fixed in, in the next release. And P4 is like almost no impact on functionality, still a valid defect that needs to be corrected, but User, um, users can function while they have this defect um, uh, active and it can be, uh, well, so it has to be prioritized lower than any P1, P2 and P3 defects. And P5 is uh, really nitpicking and it's like couple inches, couple uh, uh, pixels left or right uh, uh, move something. So it's mostly cosmetic issues that, uh, well, while you're there, fix it. Otherwise, uh, it will be sitting, uh, sitting there for, for, uh, for a while until we have other more important bugs to fix. Um, is there any questions? Pretty clear. Okay. I think I made the deadline. <laughs> you did. It's 5.29, yeah. my time, anyway. I don't know. Almost half past. Thank you, Anton, and thank you to everybody else who presented. I'm not going to bring up the slides again. Um, basically, the deck, you know, has details on what each of the teams is planning for the next couple of sprints, and um, yeah, we'll see each other in about a month. So thanks, everyone.